Good afternoon, everyone. I am delighted to kick off the afternoon portion of Radcliffe Day. And as I do so, please continue to enjoy your lunch. Let me start by congratulating the Harvard College class of 2023. And of course, we're always thrilled to be joined on Radcliffe Day by our Radcliffe alumni, many of whom will be celebrating their reunions in the coming weeks. Let me extend special congratulations to the classes of 1988 and 1973. for celebrating their milestone 35th and 50th reunions. I'm also very pleased to recognize Radcliffe College class of 1949 alumna, Ruth Villalobos, who represents the earliest class here today. And though the class of 1976 isn't in reunion this year, I understand that we're thrilled to welcome a big contingent from that class who were here to cheer on Dr. Natalia Kaneem, who is their classmate and one of the distinguished panelists this morning. We're also joined today by a number of special guests. First, I'm pleased to extend a warm Radcliffe welcome to and to salute our outgoing president, Larry Bacow. <laughs> Larry, of course, led us through the pandemic. He championed our expiration of Harvard's painful racial past and set us on the road to repair, among other initiatives. And he's been such a good friend to Radcliffe and to me over these past five years. And I want to say we're going to miss you, uh, Larry, and we wish you and Adele all the very best. Thank you. And now I'd like to recognize a few other special guests, and I would ask each of you to please stand uh, as I call your name. Provost Alan Garber. <laughs> members of the Harvard Corporation and members of the Board of Overseers, please stand. We're also joined by former Radcliffe leaders and members of the Radcliffe community. I would ask you also to stand and be recognized. First, let's welcome my predecessor as Dean, Liz Cohen. And also let's welcome the Honorable Margaret Marshall, a former Radcliffe medalist. We also have current and former members of the Radcliffe Institute Leadership Society, Advisory Council, and the Schlesinger Library Council. Uh, you, our work at the Institute would not be possible without you, and please stand and be recognized. I'm also grateful to members of the Radcliffe Institute Leadership Society, the Anne Radcliffe Society, and Radcliffe Associates. Thank you, and thanks to all of our generous donors. Finally, I'm pleased to welcome current and former Radcliffe Fellows who are joining us this afternoon, as well as Harvard undergraduates who are engaged with us in several of our programs, and high school students who participate in our Emerging Leaders Program. Welcome to all of you, and thank you for being here. And 
And now it's my distinct honor on behalf of the Harvard Radcliffe Institute to recognize Ophelia Dahl as our 2023 Radcliffe Medalist. With optimism, imagination, moral clarity, and fierce determination, Ophelia Dahl has fought for health equity and human rights since she was 18 years old. As co-founder, former executive director, and now chair of the Board of Partners in Health, she's been instrumental in building from the ground up an organization that is dedicated to providing the highest quality health care to the world's most vulnerable people. Under Ophelia's leadership, Partners in Health has provided life-saving care while strengthening health systems and preparing the next generation of medical practitioners and global health leaders. The organization serves millions of patients in 11 countries across four continents and it has shifted the global conversation about what's possible in healthcare delivery in settings of poverty. The success of Partners in Health is rooted in its community-based approach and in the practice of accompaniment, which Ophelia describes as walking shoulder to shoulder through whatever challenge arises. She continued, this often means walking with a patient, but sometimes one accompanies and is accompanied by colleagues, a community, a whole government. From the organization's earliest days to today, Ophelia's has been a powerful voice, demanding the world see health as a human right, and one too often denied the world's most vulnerable people. For those in positions of power or privilege, Ophelia reminds us that we cannot dismiss health inequities as inevitable or acceptable. As she explains, every single person deserves a high quality of care, as we all want for our own loved ones. It's only fair. Ophelia grew up in the English countryside, the second youngest child of author Raoul Dahl and actress Patricia Neal. She's described her childhood in the village of Great Mizenden as idyllic, though not without the heartbreak of medical crises and profound loss. Ophelia credits her parents with modeling courage and resilience cornerstones of her own unwavering belief in our power to affect change. Creativity permeated the Dahl household, and Ophelia learned as a young girl the power of imagination. This is another lesson she would carry throughout her life. For Ophelia, imagination isn't just a child's world of make-believe. It's an essential element of progress the thing that enables us to envision solutions to seemingly intractable problems and to empathize with those whose lives differ from our own. For shadowing her life's work in high school, Ophelia served as her school's social service monitor, traveling around her community, offering aging residents connection and a compassionate ear. When she was 18, Ophelia's father urged her to travel and see new places, and she made the fateful decision to volunteer in Haiti, somewhere she knew very little about at the time. She worked in a school for children with disabilities and with an eye care organization. And for the very first time in her young life, she came face to face with extreme poverty. She witnessed sick, pa sick patients struggling to pay for care and saw those who couldn't scrape together the money being turned away. She also saw doctors and nurses struggling to provide care without adequate facilities, medicines, or supplies. Ophelia was stunned by the extent of need in Haiti, 
a nation that, as she's underscored, is just a 90-minute flight from Miami. It was a personal turning point. She later reflected, to have seen this and to not do anything, I knew wasn't an option. It was during this first day in Haiti that Ophelia met the late Paul Farmer, our beloved Harvard colleague. The two of them connected over their shared desire to make a difference in the world and to bring quality health care to the poor. They quickly got to work. Over the next several years, Ophelia and Paul focused their efforts in Kangi, a rural community in Haiti's central plateau. Together with Fritz Lafontaine, a Haitian priest who ran a one-doctor clinic and built the first school in Kangi, Ophelia and Paul set out to build a healthcare system. They completed a door-to-door -door health census and began partnering with and training community health workers. This collaborative approach would become a hallmark of Partners in Health's method of healthcare delivery. With financing from Boston-based construction entrepreneur Thomas White, Ophelia, Paul, and their partners in Haiti built a three-room clinic. Meanwhile, Ophelia and Paul, alongside their new friends and future World Bank president, Jim Young Kim, were re refining their vision for what they called the project. They drew on liberation theology, including the writings of Gustavo Gutierrez on a, pre a preferential option for the poor. And they determined that they would reject the typical development framework that said health care in settings of poverty should focus on cost effectiveness and prevention rather than treatment. Instead, they would put the needs of the poor first, providing the same level of care that anyone would want for their own family. It was then, and it remains today, a bold idea. Together with Tom White and another friend, Todd McCormick, Ophelia, Paul, and Jim established Partners in Health in 1987. From their earliest days, Ophelia was, as Jem Kem put it, the keeper of the faith. But she also kept the group's finances in order, and these two roles often went hand in hand. Ophelia was particularly skilled at articulating PIH's unique approach and persuading donors of the organization's moral cause. In the face of immense inequity, she argued, the world's most fortunate had an obligation to act. By this time, Ophelia had graduated from Wellesley College, where she studied literature. As she's explained, quote, addressing the underlying causes of poverty and ill health is work that calls on all of us and on every discipline. And of course, here at Radcliffe, we certainly agree. One of PIH's first major inflection points, according to Ophelia, came in the early 1990s when they expanded to Peru. There, the group tackled multi-drug resistant tuberculosis, belying World Health Organization assertions that the disease was too difficult to treat in low resource settings. Remarkably, more than 80% of PAH's initial patient cohort was cured. After proving that treatment was possible, PIH then helped to cut the cost dramatically through generic drug production. Their success in Peru prompted an invitation to treat tuberculosis in Russia. And by 2002, the WHO had revised its policies to recommend treatment of multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. The key, as in Haiti, was community health workers. Following a similar strategy, PIH went on to help demonstrate that HIV and AIDS could also be treated in settings of poverty. 
despite pervasive arguments to the contrary. By the early 2000s, the organization was growing in scale and influence. As Athelia recalled, the clinic became a hospital, a classroom, a school, and the entity we referred to as the project became Partners in Health. Before we knew it, there were 10,000 patients seeking treatment, and their ailments started to broaden. They needed not just health care, but houses and schools and clean water and jobs. Four employees had become 4,000, and 10,000 patients had become over a million in Haiti alone. And the projects have spread out over several countries. Amidst this evolution, Ophelia took the helm as executive director. Over her 16-year tenure, she led Partners in Health through a period of profound growth, expanding its impact across the globe. As the organization grew, Ophelia steered it through important strategic decisions, questions of mission and morality. One early instance was her decision to accept U.S. government funds to fight HIV. At the global level, she and her co-founders had long criticized policies associated with Western development aid, including U.S. assistance, as driving and reinforcing persistent inequities between nations. But at the local level, people were dying. Ophelia and her team decided to accept the funding, but to use it in keeping with their expansive vision of what healthcare delivery entails. For PIH, treating HIV meant antiretroviral therapy and, for instance, digging a well, since patients couldn't get better without food and clean water. As a 2017 New Yorker profile put it, contained within their plan for treating HIV was a plan to treat everything. It's an approach that some skeptical observers called mission creep. But for Ophelia, this criticism misses the reality, as she put it, that these things need to be done in order for people to have a reasonable chance of being healthy. By the time Ophelia stepped down as executive director, PIH had been working for a decade in Rwanda in close collaboration with the Ministry of Health to strengthen the country's health system. It also had formed new partnerships with governments in Lesotho, Malawi, Mexico, Kazakhstan, and the Navajo Nation, as well as Sierra Leone and Liberia, where the organization pivoted from Ebola response to its trademark system strengthening work. Over the course of Ophelia's tenure, PIH's revenue grew tenfold to more than $100 million a year. And under her leadership, PIH, PIH co-founded an open source electronic medical record software, launched a global mental health care program, and opened a 300-bed teaching hospital in Mirbala, Haiti, as well as the University of Global Health Equity in Rwanda, which trains public health leaders with a focus on equity and social determinants of health. Now, this summary describes only a fraction of PIH's work under Ophelia's leadership, to say nothing of the lives she and her team changed and saved around the world through effective healthcare and social supports. Reflecting on Ophelia's impact, Paul Farmer said, quote, the qualities you most need to do this work are solidarity and empathy. Those are rare. Ophelia was and is exquisitely sensitive to other people's suffering, and that's a wonderful thing to have. And their fellow PIH co-founder, Jim Kim, hailed Ophelia as one of the great human beings walking the earth right now. <laughs> mm. 
Today, as PIH's board chair, Ophelia continues her life's work, striving for a world in which every person receives high quality health care, regardless of identity, citizenship, or wealth. It's daunting, and yet she persists. That's partly because she's a self-described optimist by nature, but she's also an optimist by intentional choice. Pessimism, she tells us, is a luxury of privilege that left unchecked breeds indifference. What's more, although much work remains, it's vital that we remember how much of human progress over the past decades was once deemed impossible. For Ophelia, this progress can be seen at the individual level, a child sustained by adequate nutrition, or a mother saved through safe obstetrical care, and also on a global scale. Consider the example of HIV, where deaths are estimated to have decreased nearly 70% since the peak of the crisis, thanks to prevention and treatment. She concludes, there is progress and therefore much hope in this work. The world still has far to go in what Ophelia has called the fight for the humanity of all people. But she keeps fighting, and in so doing, inspires all of us to do the same. In a 2019 speech, Ophelia described her commitment to use her time and talents to make a difference, referencing a Milton sonnet that begins, when I consider how my light is spent. I'm thrilled to honor Ophelia Dahl today for spending her light advancing health and human rights around the world. We'll now turn to this afternoon's keynote, during which Ophelia will be joined in conversation by John Green. John is the number one best-selling author of many novels, including The Fault in Our Stars, Looking for Alaska, and Paper Towns, as well as a book of essays titled The Anthropocene Reviewed. His books have been published in over 55 languages, and several have been adapted for film and television. John's numerous honors include the Michael L. Prince Award and the Edgar Award. He's twice been a finalist for the Los Angeles Times Book Prize, and Time Magazine named him one of the world's 100 most influential people in 2014. With his brother, Hank, John runs the popular YouTube channel, Vlog Brothers, as well as the educational channel Crash Course, which provides courses on subjects in both the humanities and the sciences. And he is a trustee of Partners in Health, and he's been a particular champion of the organization's maternal health projects in Sierra Leone. Thank you, John, for being with us today, and now it's my distinct pleasure to hand the stage, the chair, over to Ophelia Dahl and John Green. Thank you, Dean Brown Nagan, and welcome. Thanks for being here with us. Ophelia, can I begin by taking you back 40 years? To, because I know there are a lot of young people here, and in the face of the world's injustices, in the face of this sort of endless array of 
places where we see the world not as it ought to be. How do you begin? How did you begin? Before we do begin, <laughs> I just want to say that I am so happy to be on the stage with you, uh, engaged in a conversation, not an interview. Oh, God. <laughs> do, you re do, you, do you realize how bad for me <laughs> it will be if over the next 55 minutes, I do most of the talking. <laughs> it's a back and forth. It'll be a back and forth. But I also just want to say what an extraordinarily strong and powerful panel that was that we got to listen to. Thank you, Jackie, and all of the panelists. Really, really so, so inspiring um, to listen to those, those women who, many of whom are my friends and mentors. So, um, back to the beginning, 40 years ago. Um, how, do you, how did I begin? How do you begin? I, I took a leap of faith. I think, you know, one of the things about being young is that you don't think too much about things, if you're, if you're lucky. You don't, uh, as, as I was, um, I didn't think too much about where I was going or what I was gonna do. I didn't plan it out. Um, I really did just want to go and have a different experience somewhere, and I think that that was a time when it was easier to do that, uh, to be able to uh, jump on a plane, write a letter, ask if you can volunteer, and, and then end up there. Volunteer with no skills whatsoever. Uh, just the idea that I would somehow find myself being useful. But that's, I do think that what maybe things have changed in the sense that you have to send CVs at 18 to different places. Um, I, I wouldn't have known what one was, um, but that you could, you could go somewhere and just start doing something. And it was the place that I was lucky enough to be sent to um, where I met all of my greatest friends and started this work. And also you started the work with uh, Paul and your other early partners it, by listening, by taking a census, by reaching out to communities that had never had uh, people, in a, in a lot of cases, it had never had people uh, with resources come and begin with a question. What do you need? What are, the, what are the health needs in your community? Can you talk about why that was the beginning of your approach and how that has remained so central to the approach over 40 years? Yes, sure. And I, I think one other thing about starting in this work very young is that you can be in it for a long time if you're lucky. Um, and you know those people that I met in Haiti and had started working with are uh, a number of them are here. Of course, not all of them are here, but a number of them are here, and we've been working together for al almost that long. Um, yeah, I would like you to recognize them. I don't want to start naming names because I'll leave people out, but my, my, my dear friends and colleagues who are here. Um, and, you know, the starting off by going and being in the community felt as though something that, it, w it wasn't something that I knew how to do. Paul was uh, beginning to be an ethnographer at that point. He was studying anthropology, his mentors also here. Um, and he said, based on the, the, the advice of our community members there, Pella Fontaine and others said, why don't you, um, we said, why don't we go and ask them what it is that they would need if we can raise money for it? And Father Lafontaine said, you don't need to ask them. You don't need to do a census. You, they need health care, and they want a school and a clinic, and they would like jobs. And um, we, being earnest people, said, yes, but we should really go and ask them and do this census. So the good thing about that for us is that I got to learn Creole, I met members of the community, we walked house to house, and I saw for the first time just how dire the situation was in which people were forced to live. And I already thought that being in central Kanj, in the central plateau of Haiti, a place affected most terribly by a 
large uh, multinational project, a hydroelectric dam, that had impoverished that group. Walking three or four hours out into the countryside, it was positively medieval, the, the, the conditions in which people were forced to live. So the good thing about that for me is that I got to see the conditions in which people were living and ask them questions. And I still remember this census that we put together. Um, many of the questions you didn't really need answered because you could see it. But um, the conditions of someone's house, do you have... Um, do you have a thatched hut as opposed to a tin roof? Uh, are your children in school? They were not. Uh, many times the parents were out in the fields and the kids had to go and get them. Many times we didn't have a chair to sit on because they didn't have a piece of furniture in their house. Those were all important lessons in going from house to house and, and, and understanding without going to um, a school of public health to, to understand what that was. It was really very, very proximal, my early conditioning, my early learning. And then they were like, we do need healthcare, clinic, schools, and jobs. That's right. That's just what they said. <laughs> and I think it's really important and something that, that you have focused on really consistently to note that these conditions are not the result of choice. They're not the result of personal failures or weaknesses. They're the result of systems. They're the result of historical forces like that hydroelectric dam. But they're, you know, that, that as you say, these are conditions that people are forced to live in, not because of their own choices, but because of the larger systems of, of power and who they benefit and, and who they leave out. That's been a big focus of PIH's work over these decades. And I want to, I'm, I'm curious if from the beginning you understood that there was something sort of rotten in, in the state of, of Denmark in the way that, that we were, um, especially at the time, but even now, talking about the relationship between wealth and poverty, the relationship between the so-called global north and the so-called global south? Yes, I, I am not sure that I knew it when I got there, but you didn't have to be there for very long. I mean, the, the education that I had received in the UK was relatively limited. Um, now, you know, I learned quickly um, afterwards and, um, and, and happily got to go to a place like Wellesley College uh, where my horizons were expanded exponentially in terms of sort of understanding much more about the forces, sociology, history, um, and, and how that influenced uh, the ways in which people were being forced to live around much of the world. But I had a great teacher in Paul. I met him in the first couple of months of going to Haiti. I, you know, in the way that you do when you're 18, if you're lucky, um, you know, I felt, I felt like kind of a... I, I sort of felt like a hotshot in a way, because my, not with my Haitian friends, but with my family, and I would write letters home um, uh, when one wrote letters home, and, and it would take two or three weeks for them to get home, and I would vastly exaggerate the, the, uh, <laughs> what I was doing to impress my parents, and you know, all of these things, and medical things, and we were doing this, and you know, it was definitely, um, I, was, I was in some ways aspiring to do more. I could see what needed to be done, um, and my Haitian colleagues were fantastic translators for me, not just of uh, Creole to English to begin with, but also of, and, and the patients, not just my colleagues, the patients, the communities. I would go out on those walks and sit down and talk with um, women and men and teenagers. They would tell you about how their lives had been affected by that dam there. You would ask them uh, how old they were, and they would talk about it in terms of the terrible thing that happened when that dam was built. Were you born avant de l'eau or après de l'eau? Meaning before the, the water rushed through the valley, took the meager lot that they had and forced them up into the hillside? Or were they born afterwards when they were destined to be in even greater poverty? These seismic events for people living in poverty made an enormous impression on me. But I, I didn't really know how to process them. I just knew that 
I had come from extraordinary, I didn't think about it in this way, but extraordinary privilege. And it wasn't just around means and food and access to healthcare, it was also around the sort of, the hope that was placed in me. I had no question that I, that I there was no question that I didn't think about my future and what I might do and that the, to a great extent the world was my oyster. What would I do? I could, I could ponder that while I was in Haiti. Being there, living there, in the community, every day meeting people who were struggling, struggling to stay alive. That it took them a good part of their day to walk down a, uh, an 800 vertical foot walk drop with no shoes and no food to get enough water to bring it back up where it would sit in a good uh, festering, and then it would give, um, give their, them and their, their children terrible um, diarrheal disease. And the youngest kids would die of it. And we, you know, we all sat around, and, and I think that's part of the, the good thing of perhaps being young and having been socialized for success in so many ways, is that you ask yourself, what? Why, why, aren't, why isn't there any running water? Surely we can do something about that. So I think that combination of seeing that there was something rotten in Denmark that was systemic, that ability to sort of look and see how can we fix this thing and then perhaps over time with friends, with Paul, with all kinds of colleagues to say, but how can we actually fix the system all the way up to the policy? And that's the long-term piece of this. I haven't asked you a question yet. It's coming. Well, I'm glad you mentioned the long-term piece of this. I'm going to roll right through that other comment. <laughs> the, you often say that long-term problems demand long-term responses, that systemic problems demand systemic responses, that short-term time-limited interventions are simply not as effective as long-term open-ended support. And you've now been able, over 40 years, to watch in a way that not that many people have how long-term intervention is transformational, how it, how it can change not just individual lives or individual communities, but, but the whole world, whether that's whether we acknowledge that MDR-TB is and, and, and long has been curable and that we just chose for many years not, not to cure it, or whether it's expanding access to HIV treatment, expanding community health worker uh, uh, programs, as, as Dr. Agnes talked about earlier. All of all of that, when you look at the 40-year arc of getting to see that long-term change, do you think that's part of why you're optimistic now? Like part of why, as, as the dean put it, you identify as an optimist? Which is, by the way, very countercultural at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I've actually been listening to all of this, uh, the difference between being hopeful and being optimistic, and optimistic is not supposed to be as good as being hopeful for some reason or another. I am optimistic and hopeful, <laughs> uh, both of those things. You know, I, I have to say that it would be impossible to have been in this work for this long and not to have seen the really extraordinary changes that are often incremental and often backward. I mean, you know, this is not a straightforward trajectory of, of gains, as many of my great friends know, and, and many of them who are, you know, in the 11 countries in, in which PIH works and spread across the world. It's, it's, uh, it can feel very defeating at times. It really can, where you feel as though all together you have made uh, strides forward and then an earthquake happens, or then there's the 13th change of government, Minister of Health, or then there's no government, or then there's no supply chain, or then there's a pandemic, or then there's uh, an Ebola. I mean, the things that can get in the way, but that really points to the importance of systems building. Why, if you have a system, you can get back as opposed to do sort of one or two things. But yes, I mean, I was thinking about this 
as I have been a lot lately, anticipating this conversation. I was thinking about some of the early days of Partners in Health and when we were all in one room um, on River Street in Cambridge and we could all fit around a table and how nice that was in many ways. Um, and how we all had different jobs. We didn't have titles at that point. Uh, a colleague of, an, uh, uh, an old colleague of mine is here who was the, um, the office manager one day and the drug procurement director the next day. <laughs> That's because we needed someone who, who, who could get drug procurement. But one of the things that we were doing in those early days was, um, you know, a concrete example of this is we were bringing back specimens, pathologies, from different countries, but from Haiti especially, uh, some of it was um, breast tissue, cancerous breast tissue, or sputum samples from TB. And we, we all would carry these in our luggage, or, you know, and we would always sort of think about what we were gonna say, and I remember very well on the US customs form, for some reason it asked if you had any, um, it never said the things that would cause us to lie, but it said something, if you have any snails in, in, your, in your luggage. I remember thinking, no, definitely not snails. Yeah, a little bit of tuberculosis, Maybe, yeah, but exactly. no, no Just snails. a little bit of drug resistance. So, um, and we would bring it up here to, um, to the labs where it would be tested. And, um, and then we would partner with groups up here, extraordinary partners, as part of the um, Radcliffe Harvard hospital system and get it analyzed. And we had pathology friends here who would do that. And then as time wore on, we were able to build the infrastructure in these places where we can diagnose and treat these cancers in the countries, in many of the countries in which we're working, in collaboration with governments, local and national. I mean, those are, how can you not be hopeful when you look at the burden of disease and then you see that change over time. That, that keeps us all hopeful. Yeah, I think sometimes statistics can, um, can be helpful and sometimes they can uh, sort of depersonalize the reality of suffering. But a statistic I think a lot about is that when PIH arrived in Sierra Leone in 2014, the maternal death rate was so high. We've talked about one out of 100,000 live births or 50 out of 100,000 live births and the, the maternal death rate in, in Sierra Leone was over 1,000 per 100,000 live births. About 17% of women uh, could expect to die in pregnancy or childbirth. And now it's still an absolute crisis. It's still an emergency. It's still a, a, a complete failure of the system to distribute resources appropriately, but it's much, much better. How do you feel that incremental change and not be infuriated by how slow it is and continue to believe that like, even though it is radically insufficient, even though we need to be doing much more, that this incremental change is still worth pursuing? I think somehow it's this important titration between patients and impatience. I, I think that if you're too patient then, and you feel that things can happen at a certain rate, then it's, it's a disaster for many people. But there's also something about um, change that, that lasts, and that often takes longer to cement. And that means partnerships have to be forged and people have to be trained. Um, we've seen this in, in many different places, but I would say that what it took us, let's say, 10 or 15 years to do early on, as we were all learning and making friends and partners and training one another, what took us 15 years to do then probably took us only a handful of years to mm. do in another country. So the, the trend is also different. But um, turning to you, John, for a second, you were just in Sierra Leone. Um, we were in Sierra Leone together with, with colleagues. And um, as someone who jumped in, stepped into this um, years ago, I have to say, as part of your nerd fighting awesome groups, um, three million followers, 
collaborating with all kinds of people, bringing young people into this work, and raising funds for PIH. John and Hank Green um, are not just vlog brothers, but, but veritable um, warriors for this work. And when we were there together, very fun trip with Sarah and Amy and John and Byla, we, you saw, you saw it five years ago before the pandemic, you saw the plot of land then. You've come back a few years later with the pandemic in the middle. How, what does it feel like to you to see this kind of change? It feels like hope, it feels like the, the hope of the, and the commitment to change um, of the Sierra Leonean people and, and seeing what um, people can accomplish when they, when they come together and, and have the resources that they need to succeed is just so moving to me. Um, but it was also amazing. I mean, you've been doing this a long time, but you're, um, as, as Paul has said many times, like your extraordinary gift for empathy, your ability to be where, with people right where they are, uh, very, very quickly was very, very moving to me. And, um, and I wanted to ask you about accompaniment because I think everyone who knows you in this room has felt accompanied by you through their life journey um, to, to an extent that you may not even fully, fully be aware of. And that in addition to accompanying so many thousands of, of patients and healthcare workers of all, all different varieties, that you've also accompanied so many friends and colleagues through, through their life. Um, and this idea of empathy, of meeting people where they are, of walking their life with them, I, I wonder if you can talk about why that's, um, why that's so important to you, or if you have reflections on it. Yeah, I mean, accompaniment, and what it means, which is for so many people, um, you know, it's, a, it's, it's almost a personal, it's, it's open to personal interpretation in many ways. But there are some important things at, at the core of it, I think. And I learned it in a very pragmatic way um, at Partners in Health. The, the, when I learned it, I didn't realize till later that I learned it much, much earlier. But when, when you are intent on uh, taking care of people and making sure they get better rather than making sure that we tick boxes to say that we visited them or anything else, then you really have to make sure that they have everything that's needed um, for them to get better. When the most sort of pragmatic and perhaps one of the earliest reflections I have on this was, was when we had built with our Haitian colleagues the clinic in in Haiti, in Karnch. It was open, it was free. There were patients who were sick, many of them with TB, and our colleagues, physicians, were there ready, and some of them didn't come to the clinic. And we realized at that point that many people were too sick to come to the clinic, or too poor, or you know, many different things. The same kinds of things that stop people right here from being able to access healthcare. And so, we all looked at each other and said, what else is needed? And went into the community to see them. And of course, what was needed was cash transfers, donkey rides, you know, who wants to trudge three hours to a clinic with tuberculosis? Uh, what was needed was food. And so um, Paul and colleagues did a study that basically said, you know, one group of people, everyone had access to the tuberculosis care and the other, others also had access to some cash and some food and a donkey. Went from a, a dismal rate of uh, cure to close to 100% with those added extras. Right. They are called wraparound by many people and yet when I think about, you know, every time you know, my son needs something, I don't think about it as a wraparound uh, optional extra. <laughs> this doesn't extra. seem essential to his education. <laughs> yeah. To have milk. To have milk, to have uh, 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 some cash, uh, that sort of thing. But it is, you know, this was a fundamental lesson to us that we then realized a couple of things, that community, if it was really going to be, it, it, care, if it was going to be done well, had to be community-based. Right. And it had to be done by people within the community that those people trusted. And it sort of, 
it's really, it's branched out from that to, to something so much bigger. It means accompanying one another. Of course, so many of us have been accompanied and probably don't know it and have accompanied others. Um, but I also um, realized later on that, you know, accompanying supporters of our work, um, bringing them to the work, having them accompany us, the accompaniment of governments and ministries of health um, are another piece of this, sort of seeing what it is that they need and want and how to find, how to, how to get those things, how to find them. You know, I would also say, and I alluded to this at the beginning um, of my answer, that I grew up uh, in a house where I learned a great deal from my own parents, but my mother, who had had a um, really a devastating stroke at the age of 39, when she was pregnant with my younger sister, who's here, and, um, and had been paralyzed and unable to speak or walk, and she had a, uh, a career in which she needed to speak and walk as an actress, and my father arranged community-based care. We knew that we wouldn't get enough uh, with an hour of speech therapy or an hour of physical therapy a week, so he asked our uh, neighbors and friends to come, and they spent eight hours a day with her, an hour each, for about a year until she was able to get back and go to work making a movie. One year later, when she was utterly paralyzed, down one side. I think I come to accompaniment naturally without even sort of knowing it. It was just going on in the home I was growing up in. And I think that was sort of moving and it gets in your bones. Yeah, that's beautiful. I, <laughs> applause for dad. Can I just say something yeah. about accompaniment and, and also you? You know, the accompaniment takes many forms. When I, when I met Paul, he was, um, he was just starting his ethnography as an MD-PhD student here at Harvard. And I was able to walk with him as he visited patients and, and people in the community and watched an ethnographer ask questions and listen. Um, and so I realized that listening is a very powerful form of accompan accompaniment as well. And having just gotten back from Sierra Leone with John, and John is doing um, a great deal, a deep dive into tuberculosis, and I want him to talk a little bit about it um, because he probably knows as much as uh, Carol Meche, Ed Nardell, and others here um, I don't. at this point. Well, he knows how to make short videos about it <laughs> um, and make it very compelling for people to hear about. Um, but we were, we were visiting patients in, a, in the clinic in La, at Laka a Tuberculosis Hospital, which, had, um, which really was a place that a few years ago people were sent to die. Um, and I, w I would love it if you'd talk about Henry for a second, but before I do so, we, we went and with their permission interviewed a number of patients, um, some of them still recovering and, and many of them recovered. We were in this one area where uh, with some men who had other um, comorb comorbidities, they were, they were struggling with tuberculosis, but they were there and they were getting directly observed care and, uh, in the hospital. So we sat outside on a veranda and we were there and um, when John started talking to them, um, one of my colleagues nudged me and said, a couple of the guys here in this group have had a hard time taking their meds. And I, uh, John heard that too. So he was, he was talking away to them. And then after a bit, and uh, asking how they were doing, and then after a bit he said, um, how, uh, how is it, how are you taking your meds every day? It's a hard regimen, right? You have to take these meds every day. And it's almost, it's a lot of cases, it's 30 pills a day, every day. Uh, you have to take a lot in the morning. It's a very challenging regimen. I mean, I take like two pills a day and find it pretty tough. And that's what John turned to them and said when he knew, when they all said, oh, it's, it's no problem, it's no problem. And John said, well, I, and he pulled out his own pill box and he has been very um, uh, open about struggling with mental illness. He took out his own pills and he t held it up to them and said, you know, I have trouble taking my pills every day, do you have any advice for me? And the young man who was having the most trouble taking his own meds thought for a second 
looked at John and said, you have to think about your future. You have to focus on what's ahead of you. That will help you take your meds. And I was watching this interaction, and as you can imagine, I was just, um, I was moved and, and, um, and floored that this sort of accompaniment of getting people who are struggling with something by making common cause with them, by empathizing with them, by asking people's advice, that's just as powerful a piece of accompaniment. Thanks. Yeah, I think, I think many of us, I certainly, you know, when I first visited Lacan in 2019, I had no idea that tuberculosis was the deadliest infectious disease in the world, that, that this year it will again be the deadliest infectious disease in the world in all likelihood, um, and that it has been for almost every uh, year for the last 40,000 years. Um, the difference between the last 40,000 years and the last 65 is that we now know how to cure tuberculosis, and yet over a million and a half people are going to die of it this year. And that um, has been a huge focus of PIH's work. Uh, it was a passion of, for, for Paul. It was um, because it's such a glaring example of injustice that many of us in the United States think of TB and we think of John Keats or we think of, uh, you know, the James Watt. We think of 18th and 17th century uh, people when the disease um, was, was sort of a, a bit of an equal, it was never quite an equal opportunity killer, but more of one. Um, and we don't think of today when 30,000 people will die of tuberculosis this week. When you look at the arc, PIH talks a lot about bending the arc, and you look toward the future of how that arc can be bent over the next 40 years, where, where do you see us going in, in, in hope? <laughs> so don't, don't give me the answer for where you see us going in your darker moments, because I already know. <laughs> But in hope, um, I wonder where you see us going. Speaking of dark, uh, we did have some fun in Sierra Leone, I got to admit, and I think- Oh, we had a great time. The, the, the it's, instant- I mean, it's, it's an amazing, like, if you ever have the opportunity to go to Sierra Leone, I cannot encourage you enough to go. Um, it's just, it's my favorite place in the world. Um, hard stop. At you and me. Rwanda, Liberia, Peru, Haiti. I mean, really. Right. You I'm can't sorry. Have They're a all favorite. great. <laughs> all partners in health sites are equally great. <laughs> but do go to Sierra Leone and see the Maternal Center of Excellence and how it's transforming maternal health care in the region and beyond. We had some good dark moments, though, too. I mean, that part, of, part of this work, um, as all of my friends know who've been in this, and many of my friends who are not in this, and why we share such a strong bond, is this, um, this trend towards darkness. I mean, it's really one of the things that I miss most about Paul, who was perhaps one of the sunnier, uh, more optimistic people that you met, but he could... Um, he, could, he could take the darkest moment and really make it into something that you could connect to, laugh about, uh, and, and kept us going in this, really. And I found that in you and Sarah, um, in our six-hour car drives, um, racing along, or not racing along, but just, you know, uh, talking about the work, but, but thinking about it in this way. Um, the, the arc, um, you know, having seen a little bit about it, and of course my my really esteemed colleagues who know a great deal about this, including um, Dr. Agnes, who, who led a Ministry of Health through Ebola in Rwanda, um, and Natalia, um, Abby, and Rima. These are people who are very proximal to uh, and have seen change in, in many different countries around the world. You know, what I can tell you is that I think that in, we have to we have to find ways to change policy fundamentally. Mm. We have to find ways to make sure that there is more invested in 
healthcare, global healthcare, as Paul used to say, the United States is part of the globe. It's anywhere that there is uh, inequality in access to healthcare, we have to find a way to it. It's not that hard. And I think that's one of the things that we have to do is to change, um, is to change policy. And you know, one of the ways that we've seen this just recently since Paul's death is a, a, um, a really very radical um, Paul Farmer Memorial Resolution that is in, uh, in the House and sponsored by um, some politicians, including uh, in the Senate, one of our own, Elizabeth Warren, um, but, but others as well. And that really talks about universal access um, and what we need to do to change it. And all of the, there, it, is, it is a long um, and very powerful resolution. And we should, you know, contact people, contact our own leaders. I mean, I say this, we're in Cambridge, Massachusetts, but some of you live other places, and we should really try to make sure that our political leaders are aware um, of what needs to happen. As John said, a million and a half people dying of a treatable curable illness like TB, a million and a half, just because most of them are not here in Massachusetts. I mean, these are the failures of imagination that we talk about, or as um, Dr. Agnes said earlier, malaria too. I mean, they, these are things that we can, we can deal with, um, and we should. I think investing in education is an enormous piece of this as well. The University of Global Health Equity in northern Rwanda, there was a reason that we built it there with the government in Rwanda. There are people here who've been there, people there, uh, here who've taught there. I think that investing in the, uh, the important feedback loop of which PIH has tried to do always and, and, and with partners, universities, certainly Harvard, um, and to make sure that teaching and training is part of this as well. Whatever we are as a, um, as a nonprofit, um, you, without that feedback loop, without connecting the service piece, the treating patients, to training people, and then creating research to show how and why it should be done, is, it, it feels like that's an essential piece of this. So policy change and getting young people involved in this. Um, young people are extremely uh, hopeful. Paul referred to them as his retirement plan, um, always. And I think that, that that feels as though, you know, getting young people involved early on is, is key. I mean, you see this. You're a oh. young adult fiction best-selling author. They're the best. Um, they are such an encouragement. Uh, to be around people who know that uh, who know that the world can get better, and who to your, to the theme of today has been imagination. Um, who have that imagination to imagine a better world and to refuse to accept all of the old people reasons why that is impossible. Yeah. It's so encouraging to me. Yeah, I I think that the. John is exactly right in the sense that you know I think it young people have an ability to. Um, to not get entrapped by, um, by, by obstacles, by barriers. Um, and I think that that, that that is, humans are, we humans, I think sometimes we, um, I think sometimes even, even liberals and progressives, we get distracted by things. We tend to focus intensely on one or two things. Um, and it's, it's human to do so, but I would say one other thing, thinking about the future is to, encourage us not to do that so much. I mean, I, I can think of an example to do with Sierra Leone, which is from Ebola, um, in which I heard, obviously, a great deal of, of worry and concern, and I have to say, talk about hope, extraordinary, generous um, volunteering from people in this country. When there is a crisis, Americans, and I'm sure people in other places, we had 1,500 people offer to go to West Africa to help, clinical people and otherwise, to help in the midst of Ebola. Um, often, some of them losing their jobs, some of them having to quarantine, some of them facing all kinds of um, stigmatization when they got home. But the, the one thing that, that I think I would urge us not to do if we possibly can is that when one of the any, any Americans that got very sick were airlifted out and 
were treated here in one of the you know, three or so hospitals that could take care of very sick people with Ebola that survived. There was a Sierra Leonean clinician that did not get airlifted out um, and who died. And it's a terrible thing. The heat and the noise from that about that one person from many people I know was enormous. And no one or very few people were appalled by the fact that that person was living in a clinical desert to begin with, that Sierra Leone has no healthcare system. And I think sometimes we forget, we forget the, the forest because we focus on things. That's, that's the distractible thing about humans, and that's what I would urge us to do in the future is to kind of concentrate on the big picture as well as the patient who's not doing well. Well, uh, we're going to hand it over to Dean Brown Nagan now. Is that 50 minutes is up? That was I'm so sorry. fast. I'm it, sorry. It did go very fast, but Can I Can you do just talk about Henry for one second, please? Yes. Is that um, all right? When I arrived um, in Sierra, when I visited Sierra Leone in 2019, I met this kid. My son's name is Henry, and this boy's name was Henry, and he was about the size of my son, who was eight at the time. And uh, initially when I met Henry, I thought that he was some kind of official tour guide to Laka because he was so enthusiastic and um, so happy to show me the laboratory and the Gene X machine where they can type your tuberculosis and figure out uh, which, which uh, antibiotics it's resistant to and everything. And eventually I had to be like, I'm sorry, excuse me, who are you? And it, it turned out that he was a patient, and he wasn't uh, eight or nine, he was 16. Uh, it's just that his, his body had been so stunted and, and, and emaciated by untreated TB for so long. Um, and when I visited him uh, at Lacan in 2023, just a couple weeks ago with Ophelia, I asked, um, I asked one of the nurses there, do, do you remember a boy named Henry? And she said, oh, he's here. And he had come to visit us. Um, and he'd been, he'd, he's been cured of TB. He's now a, um, a, a college student studying human resources management, which sounds horrible, but it's his, his interest. <laughs> and, um, and, and in fact, like during this conversation, he texted me on WhatsApp. <laughs> um, <laughs> so... <laughs> So I think that the, the fact that he was able to access the, the newest um, regimen of, of, of TB drugs and survive TB after a thousand consecutive days at Lacan as a patient is a testament to what Partners in Health is doing. They flew the drugs. Someone here, in fact flew the drugs from Lesotho to Sierra Leone so that Henry and several other uh, patients could receive the, the care that they need, that all people deserve, and as a result, um, all of them are, are here today and otherwise wouldn't be. Um, and Ophelia, that and so much else is a legacy of, of your work and your commitment to partnership, to better imagination. Um, I am your biggest fan. I can't believe that I, it's like being on stage with Taylor Swift. <laughs> and, and I think we would be remiss if real quick we didn't just say thank you to Ophelia's family for sharing her with us and with the world. But thank you, congratulations. We're gonna hand it back now to Dean Brown Nagan, but Ophelia Dahl, thank you so thank much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. I, I do just, one, can I just say one last thing, which is that I couldn't help but notice as uh, uh, former President Wellesley, uh, Nan Cohane is here as well, that I did notice that there is a preponderance of women from Wellesley who seem to have gotten this award. So there must be something in the water or that education. Uh, so thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you, Ophelia and John, for that truly inspiring conversation. And now, Ophelia, it is my honor to present you with the 2023 Radcliffe Medal. And I'd like to read the citation. She is a bold leader who uses the power of imagination to envision solutions that others overlook. 
She is a compassionate advocate for the poor who challenges us to acknowledge that our own abundant good fortune often rests on the misfortune of others. She is a determined optimist who rejects pessimism as a luxury of privilege. And now, Ophelia, I would like to bestow upon you this Radcliffe Medal in honor of your Congratulations, and thank you all for joining us today. Please join me in a final round of applause for Ophelia Dahl. Thank you. And thank you to all of our distinguished speakers, and I hope you have a good summer.